I thought that what we'd do is go back in history and find out how water used to be. So that's what we're doing. And then we'll gradually work our way up to how the water is now. So we're going back in time because Alaska is behind the times, although they are trying awfully hard to catch up. And this is what the Hudson River was probably like in olden times before they caught up. And this could have been that brook in Brooklyn. And here's a spawning Alaskan sockeye salmon of today, followed by a beautiful rainbow trout, followed by a fisherman. And no one ever asks, how's the water? Because it's always cold and clear up here. The fishermen are followed, too, by other fishermen. And that's the way it's always been. And so nowadays, some fishermen won't even tell their best buddy where they saw the schools of big ones. Because they're afraid that next week the whole county is going to come up and camp on the bank. And there will go Alaska. Now, many fishermen don't let on that they caught anything even if they didn't. And if they did, they often let them go. And that way they can say, I hooked a whole school, but I released them all. Now, I don't want you to think that this is just a course in school relations. Although these are schools and they are relating. And that's the way it is in movies nowadays. But these consenting fish are really more than a, a symbol of how it used to be. They had to fight a long ways to get up here. And thus they're a symbol that all fish keep trying. And if we learn how to help, fish will relate like crazy. Now what we're going to do to help these schools is build brand new underwater coeducational dormitories out of old tires. And that's going to be one of the answers that we'll find to the question, how's the water? Now, to find these answers, we're going to leave unpeopled, old-fashioned Alaska and go to Florida, which is peopled, with people solving marine problems. Sun is shining, sand is yellow, the water's warm, the skies are blue, and the girls are brown, and they do what you tell them to do if you point out that you're doing a movie on marine biology and that you want to determine the conditions of the environment, that you want to ascertain any effects on the environment, that you want to try to measure those effects and determine methods to alleviate or to lessen the damage. And then finally, if the damage has been evaluated, to find ways and means to 
replenish anything that's been damaged. So here we are on a cruise in tropical waters. And we're going to talk to a scientist who's been looking for the answers, who's been trying to understand the environment. And he's always asking the question, how's water? Here I'm on a barge about a mile away from the shore. I'm talking to Dr. Jay Harmick, who is the chief fish watcher and fish counter. Can you tell me where we are? Can you locate us? Uh, we're just about a mile west of the New Marco Beach Hotel in the Gulf of Mexico. What's happening here? We're uh, adding to the artificial fishing reef that started here by a Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. Uh, the boys are uh, rolling over tires, bundles of tires that uh, have been compacted and filled with concrete so that they'll sink to the bottom. We're putting those down there to provide a substrate for organisms to grow on. And that, of course, is the beginning of the food chain, which we uh, are quite certain will end up as good game fish uh, being attracted to the reef, fish that fishermen can catch and would like to catch. What is the water like? In this particular area, the bottom is very barren. It's a sandy, shifty type bottom. And uh, if we put anything down there that uh, something can cling to to grow on, we're uh, going to improve the environment of the habitat for the fish. The water here is relatively murky. Uh, visibility ranges from a foot to maybe six or eight feet on a good day. The uh, truck, of course, is uh, bringing rejected tires from a recapping plant in Miami. The tires are unloaded at a story space on the island. And then we have a compacting machine that compresses these tires together, 15 in a bundle, uh, and the bundle ends up to be about a yard high. Well, why do you compress them? Well, we compress them for two reasons. First, we're adding weight for volume, and we're also getting rid of uh, a lot of solid uh, waste that are very difficult to get rid of any other way, and we're providing an area where the fish can uh, hide and can identify with. And actually, uh, many of the fish having homing or territorial instincts uh, have to have some point of reference in order to uh, establish its uh, own territory. Well, why tires? Tires uh, will not disintegrate. They'll last almost forever. And again, uh, we're getting rid of a, a real problem by putting them on the floor of the Gulf. And you put concrete in them? We put about 300 pounds of concrete in a bundle, and we do that so that the tires will stay where we drop them in the water, and so that they won't wash up on the beaches, and, and uh, so that we have our reef in a relatively compacted area, an area that the fishermen can find. The, the bundles weigh about four to 500 pounds, and they're put on the barge with a crane, lifts them from the storage area, from where we end. Good year. We've compacted them onto the barge. Once they're on the barge, of course, and it's happening now, the boys are rolling them off, and uh, a lot of bundles uh, takes two of them to even manipulate. Is it a general area in which you drop them? No, we have the area uh, surveyed into acre plots, and of course, part of this is experimental to see uh, how many bundles of tires we actually need to provide the most efficient fishing reef. The areas are uh, surveyed by the engineers and they're buoyed so the fishermen can find it. It's a relatively known area and it's next to one of the permanent buoy markers, the Coast Guard buoy markers, and a fisherman from Marco Island or from Naples or anywhere else can easily find it. Now, we have the acre plots separated uh, by a distance that we think will enable us to study one area without being influenced by fish populations from another area. Do you go down and look to see if there are fish down there? Yes, indeed. Uh, we have divers on our staff, and it's uh, part of their job to periodically inspect the tires to determine how much growth is uh, taking place on them, as well as to attempt to establish any facts they can about the fish populations. Well, are there fish down there? There are a great many fish around the reef already. We've been real pleasantly surprised with the numbers and kinds that our divers have uh, discovered around tires. They've seen great schools of various kinds of fish. We now What have, kind? Well, we have 30 different species uh, representing 23 families of fish. Some of the most dramatic ones, of course, were reports of large schools of snook, which we were not uh, really counting on getting around the reef, and we're not certain yet whether they were there uh, because of the reef or not, but they were there. Uh, we have a great many jacks, and uh, a lot of the bait fishes uh, which will provide food for, for the big game fishes which we expect to follow. We have a number of things we do with all of the fish that we collect in our experimental sampling. We're concerned about the, the total life history of these species 
so that we take a representative sample and we examine the stomachs to see what these fish have been eating. And of course, this gives us a clue as to the important uh, food items in, in the diet of that particular fish so that we can exert conservation efforts toward that food item as well. Then we also take scales from the fish to determine their ages. We can do this microscopically by the rings, so somewhat similar to the rings on a tree. By determining the age and looking at the scale, we can tell the condition of the fish for each year of its growth. We can tell how fast it grew and uh, sometimes when it spawned and, and various things that will add and supplement other features of the total life history of that animal. Well, how long does it take for uh, some marine growth to stick on? Well, it starts almost immediately in these warm Gulf waters, and uh, within three months, we we noticed a very decided difference in the tires that we put down, and they had good growth of algae and barnacles and uh, other shellfish on them. Well, are the tropical waters a good place for what I suppose is an experiment, isn't it? Uh, it's a very good place because we have continual growth here, and the growth of both the organisms, and of course we have continual fishing. We can dive almost 365 days a year. We can be checking on the conditions that are taking place down under the water. Well, isn't there almost an explosion of life down here? There seem to be so many birds, for instance, and so many fish. Well, it does uh, appear that way, and of course a lot of the birds are naturally migrating in from other areas, but any time you get conditions where there are almost uh, ideal for uh, any of the food organisms, the fish growth will respond accordingly. And of course, temperature plays a great part in this. What do you think that Marco Island, as a community of thousands of people in time, is going to do to all this wildlife? From all of the work that we've done so far, we do not anticipate any great changes in the uh, either the fish populations or any other populations because of the people on Marco Island. We think that they're only harvesting the excess. The but uh, uh, people have ruined other places. Why do you think they won't get a chance to here? Well, for one reason, the laboratory for which I work is constantly monitoring the environment around Marco Island so that we can detect anything that's changing. And if we do detect a change, we'll be in a position to do something about it immediately. What's happened to the pelicans? The pelicans in other parts of the country uh, have uh, suffered, and as a matter of fact, in Louisiana, have, have been eliminated. And the state of Florida has actually been transplanting uh, pelicans from southern Florida to Louisiana. And we think that there has been a breeding population reestablished in, in the pelican state. From our knowledge of the pelicans in southern Florida, uh, there was a decline, but we think now they're holding their own. In recent years, the number of pelicans around Marco Island have certainly not decreased, and we think possibly there has been some slight increase. How can you account for the fact that you have lucked out when the, the Louisiana pelicans and the pelicans in Greece aren't there anymore? Well, of course, the state of Florida was one of the first states, if not the first, to outlaw the use of DDT. This was a tremendous step forward. And we think that the decline of the pelican was well, one of the reasons for the decline of certainly was the use of DDT. Then you, you figure you're um, ahead of the game around here. Yes, we're optimistic now about the, uh, the brown pelican, and I think that the state of Florida, the conservation officials in the state of Florida feel the same. In the old days, were there uh, more birds? Overall, we think that there has been a general decline of certain species of birds, those that are on the rare and endangered list, especially the bald eagle is on the decline. I'm sure it's on the decline here as well as throughout the rest of the United States. However, uh, we're still maintaining a fairly good population of bald eagles. Some of the other birds are dependent upon conditions not only here but in other areas in their migratory patterns so that in spite of the fact that we maintain a good environment for them to winter here, they may face something different when they fly north in the summer. Say, how are the eagle nests working? The eagle nests uh, have not proven successful thus far, although we haven't given up on them by any means. As they weather and age, they may become a little bit more attractive to the eagles or to the ospreys. Well, but the Everglades are so close, and there are so many great trees for eagles for just a few miles from you. Why do you bother to put up these eagle trays? We would like to have some eagles nesting within binocular sight. Oh, you want to make a zoo right around the edge.
Yes, that's about right. Well, all these things that you're, you're doing here, you think this is a pattern for the future? I would hope so. Suppose you're out there with your twin 65s and you see a, a jogger along the beach and you pick him up to give him a hand and uh, he says, you're polluting the place with those outboard motors. What are you going to say? Well, I think try to inform him that the outboard motor companies have really... Oh, it, it's a girl. I would have to inform her that the outboard motor companies have made great strides in anti-pollution programs. They've done things with the fuel systems that uh, actually prevent the spillage of uh, excess oil overboard. They've cut down on the noise, and it seems to me that they have really taken some of the initial steps in anti-pollution measures. Well, doesn't that unexploded gasoline drain back, you know, after it goes through the carburetor and out the exhaust? Not in their new systems. Uh, that excess gasoline is burned over again. And I'm not really knowledgeable on this particular system, but I do know that it's available on all outboards. Then you don't consider, as someone deeply concerned with the environment, uh, outboard motors don't bother you? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the outboard is our sole method of survival here. Uh, our research depends on the outboard motor. It's the only adequate device we have for getting around in our shallow waters. And I certainly do not look upon the outboard as a pollution machine. I do, uh, of course, consider boats as a possible source of pollution, but this is a mechanical problem that can be solved too and is being solved. And this, is, of course, has to do with the dumpage of uh, raw sewage overboard. And this has nothing absolutely to do with the motor. Well, are, are the people on this island boat-oriented? Do most of them get around on boats? Yes, we do know that over 70% of the people moved here with fishing as their number one outdoor recreation. To go fishing here usually requires a boat. Most of the people uh, live on waterway lots and have docks in back of their houses, so it's certainly a boat-oriented community. It does it involve intricate navigating? It certainly does, especially when we take the inside route through the 10,000 islands uh, to do our boat counts. How do you relate to the Everglades National Park? We're close to it in proximity. We run our Creole Census surveys to Lossman's River, and people who dock their boats there with their fish catches actually have made some of those catches in the National Park so that we have information on the fisheries all the way to and into the park. I know that you're making artificial reefs out of tires, and I see those fancy colored boards. What are they? We call them artificial kelp. Do you think they'll work? Well, I think almost any material that's put on or near the bottom of the barren gulf floor will produce a substrate which will allow organisms to grow on. And so, from that respect, it will work. Now, we're using wood for this, and this is strictly experimental. You have, well, let's see, quite a few people working here. Could you tell me what they're doing? This is one of the busy times of the month. This is immediately after our uh, monthly sampling program in the marine environment. All of the samples are brought in here for analysis. Where do you get it? This material is off the bottom in about the bottom eight to ten inches uh, of the bays surrounding Marco Island. These people are actually sorting the vegetative material, the algae and the grasses, from the animal material. Then our biologists identify, count, and measure it. This will give us some indication, or give us a good indication, actually, of uh, the condition of the waters we do this at the same time of the month, in the dark of the moon, at the same stations. After we have enough of these samples analyzed, and we can detect what changes, if any, are taking place to the marine environment. Will that mean more fish, or what does it mean? It means a good, healthy environment, generally, consists of a large number of species, and not a great dominant number of one species. Another part of our program is our transplanting of uh, mangroves. One of the methods that we're using now is the creation of an artificial mangrove island that's uh, built up of dredged material, and we're putting three to four foot mangrove plants on the island in the hope of a real fast establishment. So far, we've been fairly successful, and we're quite optimistic. Well, you use a technique in dredging that is 
I don't know if it's unique, at least it prevents sending silt all over. How does it work? Is that the way to do this kind of thing? The uh, method is to use a diaper or a container around the dredge. This is a styrofoam float with a plastic material hanging down from the float and weighted to the bottom. This prevents any of the silt to stirred up in the dredging operation from washing out into surrounding waters. We have a very good monitoring program to uh, make sure that none of the silt gets out and if it gets over the state standard of 50 Jackson units, the dredge is immediately shut down and further precautions are taken. How about the crabs? Are they increasing or decreasing? We've already noticed that Every bundle of tires produces one or two large stone crabs. It provides a habitat for that crab. And so we've actually increased the available habitat for stone crabs. The blue crab is probably more abundant than, than most people realize. There are more of them here than we thought. We have a program of tagging the blue crab to try to determine its movement patterns and other features of its life history. Are there fish in these canals? We have discovered, and uh, somewhat to our amazement, that the canals are actually loaded with fish. We have already collected over 50 different species, and of these 50 species, about 30 of them are what we consider game and food fishes. We are amazed, more amazed, every time we pull a net through those waters at the quantity and the variety of fish that we have in them. We actually think that the canals may be playing a much more important role in the uh, survival of certain fish species than we ever had imagined before. Well, then this great concern about canals doesn't check out, or you're finding out about it, or what would you say? So our canals may be a little bit different than some of the others that have been classed as detrimental. So we have absolutely no sewage going into our canals here, treated or untreated. So this is a real plus factor to begin with. You say there's no sewage in the water. Uh, how come? The sewage here is treated, and then the effluent is sprayed as irrigation water on the golf courses, so that um, this has a long way then to filter th through the ground, and of course the nutrients are utilized by the grass growing on the golf course, so that in all actuality, pure water returns to the system. Isn't that going to be a pattern all over the country? Wouldn't you say very soon that sewage has to be treated, that you can't dump it into the water? I think that most places in the near future will require secondary treatment, but I think that this particular method of treatment for the entire country is probably a long ways off. Well, this island used to be part of the Everglades group, and there used to be a lot of birds here. What happened to them? Where did they go? Naturally, when the swamps and marshes are filled in, the shorebirds are forced to move a little ways. But that's all they do is move. They haven't been destroyed, and uh, there's plenty of feeding and resting and nesting areas in this section of Florida to take care of a great many more birds than we have here. Three bird islands, which are just south of the high-level bridge coming onto the island, are used as uh, roosting areas for a great many and a large variety of birds. And we have noticed over the past years, and of course from historical knowledge of people who have lived here, uh, we've gathered the information that the usage of these islands has actually increased. Then it isn't a completely bleak picture. No, we're optimistic that we can maintain a good environment. Then you like it here. I love it here. And you like what you're doing. Absolutely. Man is part of the environment. And using the knowledge that we have today, man can live in harmony with his environment and still have the animals and the birds and the fish that he loves so dearly. What'd you find today, Art? Well, a new bunch of tires. Already it's completely surrounded with bait fish, pin fish, grunt, sardines, and anchovies, all kinds of feed. You just wouldn't believe the fish in the town. Don't be there. <laughs> I'm telling you. 